not quite like the city, um, it's, it's Lyon, but um, it's, we're very glad to welcome you to this panel, which is going to be quite different from some of the other panels in this conference, um, stemming off of the idea of the human rights that are so important internationally, we are gonna be looking at the human rights and what happened in the media um, that was unable to save the life of Troy Davis six months ago. Um, my um, our, my co-panelists, Mark McPhail and David Harris, are each gonna present something about that and then I will wrap up with some comments on traditional and new media. Mark McPhail is the Dean of the College of Arts at the and communication at the University of Wisconsin-Whitewater. He's the author of Zen and the Art of Re Rhetoric, An Inquiry into Coherence, The Rhetoric of Racism Re Revisited, Reparations or Separation. His research and creative work have appeared in the Quarterly Journal of Speech, Rhetoric and Public Affairs, the Howard Journal of Communications, Critical Studies in Mass Communication, Rhetoric Review, and Qualitative Inter Inquiry. He served as an expert witness in the state of Utah and for the United Nations International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. Mark? I'm sorry, David is going first. And <laughs> David Harris is the managing director of the Charles Hamilton Houston Institute for Race and Justice at Harvard Law School. David has extensive experience in many facets of civil rights issues from police brutality and racial profiling to redistricting and domestic violence, as well as fair housing community development. He previously served with the US Department of Housing and Urban Development and with the US Commission on Civil Rights and presently is the president of the board of director of the Massachusetts Foundation for the Humanities. He is recognized as a leading voice for civil rights in the Boston region and has spoken extensively at local, regional, and national forums on civil rights, regional equity, and fair housing. And with that, um, David, if you... Uh, thank you, Rachel, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you this morning. and. Uh, you know, it's interesting, I often start uh, my uh, presentations with a joke, it's you know, kind of standard fare, and there's a joke I tell often, which today seems to me somehow even more appropriate than other times. It's a story about a, a young man who's a student in a zoology class who hasn't gone to class all year, and it comes up to the final, and he asks, uh, uh, the day before, he asks a friend of his, my God, what am I gonna do? And the friend says, listen, go learn everything you can about elephants, about uh, worms. And the kid says, okay, I'll do that. So he goes and he reads and he reads, he stays up all night. He goes the next morning, sits down, opens up the exam, and it says, tell me everything you know about elephants. And the kid clearly was distraught. Uh, and he agonizes for a while, and then the light goes off, and he starts writing frantically. Elephants are very large mammals. They have several distinctive characteristics. They have very large ears. They have tusks. They have a long trunk. The trunk is like worms and worms, and he proceeds to say everything he knows about worms. For me, what happens is I actually wind up talking about race a lot. I also feel a little bit out of place uh, after the last presentation, and so we're going to really shift gears in a way and we're gonna talk a little bit about the worm and the apple. We're gonna talk specifically uh, about the death penalty in the United States and the death penalty, as uh, Rachel said, in relation to Troy Davis. The death penalty in the United States, uh, as Banner notes in a book, uh, From Lynch Mobs to a Killing State, is related to our thinking about uh, race. It's related to lynching. As Justin Levinson has noted, Research on the continuing media portrayal of African Americans as aggressive criminals supports the argument that when people think about the death penalty, they think about African Americans. Although it has now been hidden uh, largely behind closed doors, the association with lynching remains strong. This is incredibly clear when we think about what happened immediately after the GNS6 incident in which nooses were found across the country, <clears throat> and it was very clear that the residence of the notion of lynching was deeply ingrained in our culture and our society. Uh, lynching, the death penalty, and the entire system of punishment remained dominated by what was called the racial contract, which operated to maintain the existing distributions of power with a complex but enduring power, ar as argued by uh, Kaufman and Osborne in a book called Lynch From Lynch Mobs to the Killing State. 
As Charles Mills has noted, the United States has historically been, and in some ways continues to be, a racial polity, a political system predicated on non-white subordination. Mills also notes that the racial contract is continuously being rewritten uh, to create different forms of racial polity. The operation of this contract and the results have been underscored by a number of books about a number of topics in recent years, including uh, from lynch mobs to the killing state, slavery by another name, redemption, the new Jim Crow, which I'm sure most of you have heard about, and a fascinating book by a uh, former, by a Harvard Law School professor named The Collapse of American Criminal Justice. The Troy Davis case sadly brings out much, much of this into clear relief. I assume most of you know who Troy Davis was, and I'll tell you that uh, in our paper that's, uh, I think, on your flash drive, there's a pretty uh, succinct summary of the case. Uh, but it does tell us a great deal about the racial contract. Uh, the case involved the murder of uh, a white man by one of several people of color at the scene at the time. Note that in my telling, I don't refer to him as a police officer, the murder of a police officer, although that's how, he's constantly, how this case is constantly described as the murder of a police officer. The fact is that when uh, uh, Mark McPhail, not this Mark McPhail, uh, was uh, uh, murdered, he was not serving as a police officer. He was not in uniform, and he's not serving as a police officer. So, I mean, I often think about, you know, when a plumber is murdered, we don't say the murder of a plumber, right? So, but we say the murder of a police officer, even though he wasn't serving in that capacity. So, Troy Davis's conviction rested solely on eyewitness testimony. There were accounts of other people of color who were present at the scene at the time that Mark McPhail was killed. So, this is what, I mean, so uh, the fact is, though, that, that uh, Troy Davis is continuously portrayed in the media as a cop killer, an incredibly loaded term that carries with it a great deal of animus, hostility, and anger. <clears throat> so as I said, the he, was, uh, 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 ex he was convicted based on eyewitness testimony, uh, and, it, and it's important to understand that this crime took place in a, small, in a dark parking lot. Again, this is a this is a fascinating little uh, page from a from a website that uh, tried to look at where one of the witnesses was standing, <clears throat> one of the witnesses who identified Troy Davis as the killer in this case. The top picture, as you can see, shows from this person's vantage point at a hotel, very far away, uh, what a telephoto lens would show. You want to note that even in that lens, you can't, even in that shot, you can't see the face very well. In the second shot, it's a kind of normal lens. It's, not it's a kind of medium-range telephoto lens, and you can barely see the yellow jacket there. And in the bottom uh, image, that's what the naked eye would see, and you can't see a person there at all. But the testimony of this witness was accepted and admitted as part of what uh, convicted Troy Davis. Uh, these are images of Troy Davis uh, at different times. And as you can see, at, when it's kind of high school graduation, it's a normal-looking guy. Um, and again, this is uh, another picture of Troy Davis. I want you to kind of look at these pictures closely because what he looks like is, is in fact, relevant to part of what we're going to talk about today. So uh, who were the people, who were the eyewitnesses that recanted their testimony? <clears throat> uh, one was uh, uh, Antoine Williams, uh, who's... Uh, who spoke quite, quite often and frequently after the trial about it. Uh, but one of the most significant things about his testimony is that he actually, his testimony is based on a statement he signed even though he can't read. So he, he, he signed a statement that he couldn't read uh, and uh, in fact he did so uh, largely under duress. Again, uh, his Jeffrey Sapp similarly uh, was concerned that uh, he was going to run into uh, uh, problems with the police and if he didn't testify against Troy Davis. And this was true for several of the witnesses who recanted their testimony, uh, basically saying that they had been intimidated into testifying against Troy Davis by the police. Uh, and again, one of the things that's important is that uh, the, the claim of the witnesses, these are witnesses who under different circumstances whose testimony would largely be impeached by prosecutors. These were people who had criminal records, uh, a lot of involvement with uh, the police, and who under different circumstances, every prosecutor would be going after to nail. But in this case, when they, they were testifying against Troy Davis, they did everything they did to build him up. 
and then later when they recanted their testimony, uh, claimed that they were unreliable, that the recantations were unreliable. <clears throat> and again, Dorothy Farrell had a similar kind of situation where uh, she was afraid uh, uh, that her parole would be revoked. Several of the witnesses uh, identified another of the eyewitnesses, a man named Red Coles, as the actual shooter. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of evidence came up since the trial that suggests that, in fact, he might have been. Over the course of the year since Troy Davis was convicted, as most of you may know, he, he garnered a great deal of support from a, a number of people, a number of very prominent people around the world uh, who came to his support and uh, really argued against his execution. Not necessarily, I mean, and another interesting thing that's important to understand is that the, kiss, the issue isn't necessarily whether I or anyone else believes that Troy Davis was innocent, but whether or not he had been proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. So, uh, Troy Davis's case was really uh, uh, highlighted by his sister, Martina Carrera, uh, who has, was suffering from cancer for many, many years, but who made it her life's work uh, to try to save him. And she started a website, uh, and that website was actually uh, the, uh, the start that, that generated all the subsequent websites, all based, were based on this simple website that she herself started with no training, no background, uh, you know, and you can see it's not a particularly uh, a snazzy uh, website, and it, and it never was, but it was designed uh, basically to uh, uh, generate additional uh, uh, internet activity, which it did. And I'm sure that, I'm, I'm sure many of you over the, you know, past uh, years uh, received an email blast, e-blast from various folks. Uh, uh, the NAACP took up this case a little late, but they, they mobilized their entire, uh, their entire operation. Uh, the ACLU, the uh, uh, Human Rights Watch, uh, 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 Amnesty Inter International, they all took up the site and, and uh, uh, basically generated millions and millions of uh, dollars, millions and millions of emails <coughs> uh, to try to uh, get the, the Georgia Board of Pardon and Paroles uh, to uh, commute the sentence. <coughs> Again, it's a comp and there were a lot of complicated legal things going on, but at the same time, there was all this activity going on on the internet and trying to generate support for Troy Davis. Uh, and, and in fact, as you know, Troy Davis was executed. Um, uh, but one of the other things that happened on the internet that's, that was just amazing was that the execution uh, 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 was scheduled for seven o'clock one night and you know, I know, and I'll never forget. Uh, I'll tell you, I went home. Uh, my son came up to me, and, and at about a quarter of seven, I was still on the phone working on the case, and and he was crying. He said he saw I was crying. He said, "Dad, you know, they're going to kill him." I said, "I, I said, uh, uh, sweetie, I'm still trying to save him." Uh, and you know, uh, I said, "Let's go out. We have to go out." I, so I could get away from because there was real time coverage of this stuff. So we went to the store. I came back, and. Uh, you know, thinking that, you know, that Troy Davis had been executed, and in fact, he had received a stay, right? And I put my son to bed, uh, and, and I said, you know, sweetie, you know, we did it, you know, he'll live another day. Um, and as you may know, uh, that, was, that was about 9 o'clock, I put him in bed, 11 o'clock they executed him, right? And so I had to wake up the next morning and tell my son that he was dead, and it was a terrible thing. Th this site has incredible photos of what was going on at, that, at the camp. And one of the things about what was going on outside uh, the place where Troy Davis was executed is it looked very much like those lynch mob parties, right? Uh, it was like uh, Occupy. It was, a, it was an amazing, but it was the reverse of it. Uh, 